Um, if I were giving this talk in 2019, I might start with a slide like this. This takes the 3,000 odd counties in the United States and it divides them up on the basis of their density levels. Because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. Now, what you can see in the blue line is the relationship between population density and per capita incomes. The densest tenth of America's counties have incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is something economists call agglomeration economies uh, that reflects a combination of selection and, and treatment, uh, meaning that it also reflects the fact that people with um, who are more able may select into dense areas. Uh, it may also select reflect partially the fact that areas that have innate productive advantages like proximity to a coal mine or to a port then attract people and then make those people more productive. But I think it is fair to say that over the past 30 years, the urban economics literature has come to the conclusion that a substantial fraction of this is actually the fact that, that being in the midst of density actually makes you more productive. Um, the top line shows a fact that is slightly more surprising, which is the relationship between population change between 2000 and 2010 and initial population density. So whereas uh, uh, Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the Eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. Along with this economic productivity of urban areas is a increasing demand for people to actually live in areas, which has shown up in a giant price boom. Okay, this shows the growth in prices and it's using the Zillow zip code data, uh, it comes from work by Nathan Hipsman. It looks at the price growth between 1997 and 2015 based on distance to the city center. And that's what you're seeing along the horizontal axis. And what you can see there is that the places that are closest to the city center had much larger price growth over this time period than the places that were on the city's edge. So over the past 20 years, prior to COVID again, there was a tilt which favored people living in intense areas. And this is related to a phenomenon that I've called the rise of the consumer city. Rising education, rising incomes, coupled with declining crime levels, have enabled cities to emerge as playgrounds for the prosperous and people are willing to pay for those pleasures. You can see this, this is a map of, of UK uh, housing price to income ratios. And as you can see in the area around London, prices are a much higher uh, ratio of incomes than places out elsewhere. So routinely prices are 10, 12 times annual income in the greater London area, as opposed to four times or three times elsewhere in England. And that reflects the demand for London as a place of pleasure, as well as a place of, of economic activity. Now, all this is very 2019, because in the spring of, in the, in the winter of 2020, plague returned to our urban world. Now, plague is an old companion of urban life. Of course, there are, you know, there's plague in, in uh, Exodus, um, but our first really thorough discussion of an urban plague is the plague of Athens, which is described by Thucydides. Um, in a sense, the backstory for the plague is the tremendous economic and cultural and military success of Athens during the fifth century BCE. In a sense, classical Athens is doing everything that you would possibly hope a city can do. It's connecting brilliant people and it's enabling them to create breakthroughs in uh, culture, in history, in sculpture, in architecture, in democracy itself, in the sciences, in math, in philosophy. In fact, you know, it is the birthplace of, of the writing of history itself. Now, all of its success then excites the envy of its rural land-based military rival, Sparta. And uh, Sparta and Athens go to war in 430 BCE. The strategy of the Athenian leader, Pericles, is to summon the Athenians and their allies into Athens behind the walls of the city with the idea that the walls will keep out the Spartan warriors and the Athenian fleet is then free to harass the coast of the Peloponnesian Peninsula where the Spartans live. The strategy is perfectly sound militarily. The walls do in fact keep out the Spartan hoplites, the Spartan warriors, but the walls do not manage to keep out disease and a plague enters in through the Athenian port of Piraeus and it lays waste to the city. For two years, 
uh, perhaps a quarter of the Athenian population dies. Thucydides describes a, a city that's gone mad, a city in which people are living only for the, day, for the day. Now, Athens soldiers on for another quarter century. It finally loses to Sparta in 405 BCE. Um, maybe you want to mute your side. Is that, uh, is that better, Chanel? I, I don't know what you're... Uh... I, I'm doing it right now. Okay, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Um, so they soldier on for another 25 years, but in some sense, you know, after losing a quarter of their population, the glory that was Athens is dimmed forever, right? Athens goes from perhaps being the New York of the Mediterranean world to uh, then being the Boston, then perhaps the Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it, it becomes a, you know, a, a, a boutique town uh, for the immensely overeducated. Uh, for five centuries, plague is relatively absent from the Mediterranean, and then it strikes again in the second century CE, the plague of Cyprian. The plague of Cyprian, although a devastating demographic event, does relatively little harm to the Roman Empire because it strikes during the period of the second century, which is Rome's most stable period. And in some sense, one of the central facts about plagues and other natural disasters is that the damage that they do in the long run is determined by the strength of civil society at the time that they strike. Second century, Rome is strong, and so the plague does relatively little other than kill people. Third century, Rome is much weaker, uh, and so the plague of, sorry, the second century plague is the Antonine Plague, the third century plague is the Plague of Cyprian. Um, the Plague of Cyprian does much, does much more damage. And then, of course, the really colossal one is the Plague of Justinian, which strikes in the sixth century. The backstory for that is that after the Western Roman Empire was overrun by Ostrogoths and other conquerors in the fifth century, the Eastern Roman Empire continued. Justinian was still quite strong. And as the first generation of relatively competent Gothic leaders like Theodoric the Great gets replaced by the second and third generation of far more mediocre leaders, he sends out his warlord Belisarius to reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world. Belisarius conquers North Africa. He's doing incredibly well in Italy. And then suddenly plague strikes Constantinople in 541 CE. Again, another devastating event, and one that topples this whole scheme. Plague keeps on coming again and again, and in some sense, it, it may be credited with plunging Europe into centuries, if not a millennium, of darkness, right? Um, and in some sense, the reason why it's so devastating is that Justinian's world is already a world that is balancing. It's already a world that's weak. And so this plague can be you know, particularly devastating. And in some sense, what I want you to think about today is, are we at a point like the second century Roman Empire in which you know, the plague is likely to be fairly irrelevant, or are we at a point more like the sixth century where in fact we are far weaker in the face of the, the plague? Um, now, for most of the past 650 years, we've been pretty strong. Um, the 19th century was a great age of globalization and it was also a great age of pandemic. In the first decades of the 19th century, it was yellow fever, which is a mosquito-borne illness that emerges out of Africa, gets carried across uh, to the Caribbean, and then makes its way up to the cities of the eastern seaboard of the US. The number of people died, and you can see 40 per uh, thousand in some years, or 30 per thousand, that's 3% of the population, right? That's a much higher number than has died from COVID-19. Cholera then emerges in the Ganges Delta in 1817. It makes its way over land in the British Empire. Then it gets carried over sea, eventually to the US. Again, devastating, maybe 5% die in the first cholera outbreak of 1832, much higher death rates than were experienced uh, by, in COVID-19. And yet the city survived. City survived and thrived partially because in the poorer world of the 19th century, poor people still sought the economic opportunities in cities despite the prevalence of death. Um, they also survived because cities came together and made themselves more functional, right? And as much as I am a, you know, an ardent supporter of economic freedom, it's hard not to think that there are also things that governments need to do. And the most important job of government is actually to provide clean water. The 19th century, in a sense, and this is the stance that we take in our book, um, in the third chapter, is in some sense the moment in which governments cease to be really exclusively agents of death and actually start doing some things that are good, right? 18th century governments do very little that matters other than actually killing people. Uh, 
By the 19th century, you have city governments that have invested in sewers, that have invested in aqueducts, that are spending as much in the US on clean water as America's national government is spending on everything except for the post office and the army. And gradually, deaths start to go down. It's not just about uh, infrastructure. It's also about rules that go along with it. So I work today on clean water in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, where there's a huge last mile problem where well-meaning Western funders will invest in things like uh, water mains. And yet, because they expect poor households to pay for the final connection, the poor households say they're not, you know, they don't have that kind of cash and so they don't do it. And so they continue to use their shallow wells and their boreholes and their pit latrines and they continue to get sick. Well, no one should have been surprised about that. That's exactly what happened in New York in the middle of the 19th century. You can see that the Croton Aqueduct opened in 1842 and there continues to be cholera epidemics for 25 years after it opens. My great, 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 great grandfather died in the 1849 cholera epidemic that's right here. The reason why they died, people continue to die, is the last mile problem, is that poor New Yorkers didn't connect. And it wasn't until you had the Board of Health, which started actually fining tenement owners who didn't connect, that you actually started seeing the city get healthier. I will make one final point, which I think is somewhat important. By the time of the Board of Health, we actually knew what caused cholera. We knew that it was a waterborne illness because of the experiments of, because of the data gathered by Dr. John Snow in London in 1854, where he actually learned that it was a waterborne plague. And you know, he took a pump, he took a handle off of, of a pump that he thought was spreading the disease and the disease went down. But for most of the early 19th century, these massive investments were actually fueled by medical error. There were two large view theories of the cause of contagion in the early 19th century, cause of deaths, one of which is the contagion theory, which is that you got it from other people, and the second of which is the miasma theory, that in fact the, the, there were vapors that came out of the ground that infected you with yellow fever and cholera. The contagionists argued for quarantine, the miasma theorists argued for investing in sewers and aqueducts and draining the swamp. The contagion theorists were entirely correct on the medicine, but in fact, the public health benefits of the miasma theorist idea were much higher. So even though they didn't understand the disease by a happy chance, their public health investments ended up being exactly what our cities needed. Um, and for the last century, we have enjoyed a remarkable hundred years where we have been relatively free of urban pandemic, right? Since the 1918, 1919 uh, outbreak of the influenza pandemic. And then all of a sudden it happened again. In the early years, it was in the early months, in the early days, it was disproportionately urban. So this shows the prevalence of the disease as of April 30th, 2020. Um, New York, overwhelmingly, New Orleans, Atlanta, uh, Detroit. These were the places where the pandemic was most prevalent in the US. This is because just like fifth century BCE Athens, in the 21st century, cities are the nodes on our global network of travel and trade. They are the ports of entry for goods, for new ideas, and for diseases. And that's exactly what happened, right? Disease came in carried by visitors from Europe, carrying from American tourists returning from Europe into New York, and it spread very, very rapidly. Um, the dense confines of cities also enable things to spread easily. This shows the relationship between population density and the prevalence of the disease as of May, 2020. And this was certainly true in the developing world as well, in which you really can't separate yourself if you're living in an informal settlement. This shows the relationship as of June 3rd, 2020, between the share of the population living in a favela, an informal settlement in uh, Brazil, and the, the proportion of people who have the disease. This shows the relationship in India between the share of people who have infections and the share of people living in slums. The remarkable serological work of Anup Malani, who actually went out and measured antibodies that people had for the disease in Mumbai slums found that by July of 2020, in Mumbai slums, more than 50% of the people had already been exposed to COVID. There's no means of protecting yourself in a slum from the spread of the disease. And so people got it very, very quickly. They didn't die in huge numbers in these slums because slum dwellers tend to be young and they tend to be thin. And so the comorbidities that made the disease so deadly in many parts of, of the wealthy world were absent in these Indian slums. Now, of course, an airborne pandemic, as opposed to a waterborne one, can spread and does spread easily everywhere. And so by November uh, of 2020, so almost a year ago, the disease was hotspot was in the Dakotas. Uh, 
right? Just like the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919. And unlike the cholera pandemics, which, you know, basically if you're on your own well, uh, if you're separated from other people living on a farm, you're not going to get cholera. But you can easily get a, an airborne disease like COVID-19. And so it's spread everywhere. And so it, it's, you know, cities are just the ports of entry. They're not the long run determinants of your vulnerability to this disease. Moreover, within cities, you see interesting patterns. So I don't know how many of you know the five boroughs of New York City. This is from a paper that I published, uh, I guess published this year, wrote last year, on the spread of the disease in New York and other cities. Um, this area over here, this is Manhattan. This is where they have the tallest buildings. This is Brooklyn Heights. These are the outer boroughs. These are the lowest density areas, Staten Island, the Bronx, Queens. And what you can see is the places that are densest within New York, the places that have the tallest buildings also have the lowest prevalence of the disease. It's not as if, you know, what's going on is people who live in large apartment buildings were more likely to get this. Why? Why do you see this pattern? Because in fact, it's not density of dwelling places, it's frequency of contact that spread the disease. This shows the change in the share of the population, who are, the change in the number of trips. Trips are measured by cell phones. And somewhat amazingly, this is the first you know, major outbreak in history in which we've had widespread data on human mobility, thanks to cell phone data like the data from SafeGraph. And so, as you can see, in the wealth, in these highly dense areas, there was a reduction of mobility by between 86 and 94 percent. The amount of mobility just really shrunk. I can't tell you what fraction of this is people moving outside to other parts of the city versus, versus other parts of the country versus just staying at home in their apartments. Um, but there was much less of a mobility decline in the outer boroughs. And there's a very strong relationship during these early years between the amount of travel, this is just across zip codes, and uh, the cases per capita. Our estimates are that a 10% reduction in the number of cases per capita, is, in the number of trips, is associated with a 20% reduction in the number of cases per capita. And we do that through a, um, we have an instrumental variable strategy to actually do that. Um, we don't mean to suggest that this is something that reflects the, you know, intelligence of people in, in Manhattan relative to elsewhere. It's the opposite, it's about privilege. Okay, it's about the people in downtown Manhattan were either rich enough to be able to move to country houses and in industries that enabled them to dial it in. And as we'll see later, there was a huge educational divide between the, between the people who could actually zoom into work versus the people who had to come in to necessary occupations. And so the outer boroughs had people who worked as nurses in hospitals or worked in supermarkets or worked in, in uh, pharmacies. And so they kept on coming to work uh, and they were on the front line of getting the illness. Um, this shows the change in mobility by education. So this is from Victor Couture, Jonathan Dingle, and Jesse Hanbury. Three things I want you to take away from this. One of which is they've split this up. This is Pennsylvania data. Uh, they split it up between more educated and less educated areas in Pennsylvania. And as you can see, before the disease strikes in, it's the more educated people that move around more. Okay, that are more exposed to people. No big surprise there, right? The educated and the wealthy are actually more mobile. Um, certainly the first person in my world I knew who had gotten COVID-19 was the president of Harvard, Larry Bacow, because nobody shakes more hands than the president of Harvard. Second thing I want you to take away from this is after the pandemic hits, notice that you have the least educated people are moving around significantly more than the more educated people are. Both of them shrink, but the more educated people shrink much more. Third thing I want you to take away from this is it was often depicted as if there was a hard barrier, a hard question that governments got to choose between saving people's lives and shutting down the economy. Um, that was a false, uh, a false quandary because in fact, the state of emergency is declared here. There were no barriers, okay, put in place here to being open at this point in time. By the time you get here, okay, you have businesses being closed, but as you can see, most of the mobility is already down. By the time you have the strictest of all rules, the shelter in place rule, it makes no difference whatsoever. It was fear, not economic regulation, that shut down the economy. Now, this shock was not just a, uh, a shock to our health. It was also an economic shock an economic shock that we have not experienced the full brunt of because the economies, the governments of the West, uh, the economies of the wealthy world have decided to spend an enormous amount of money to avoid uh, seeing the full extent of, of the shock and its damage to uh, our, our economies. And this is a change from the past. So if you go back to the medieval Black Death, strikes Europe around 1350, 
kills off a third of the European population, an abs absolutely devastating human event. But the people who survive end up being a lot richer because in an economy based on subsistence agriculture, right, the amount of land per person determines the amount of wealth per person. And even for those workers who didn't own land, competition had just gotten hotter for their services. And so wages go up almost everywhere in Europe after the Black Death. And in fact, there are some people who argue that those heightened incomes that came about because of the slaughter of, of, of a third of Europe then fueled the demand for luxury products, which gave us the urban boom of the 15th century. Flash forward four and a half centuries, five and a half centuries, to the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919. Best work on this is Francois Veld's work of the Chicago Fed. Um, this is an industrial age. The pandemic strikes, factories are sometimes shut down, mines, coal mines are certainly shut down, but people don't start demanding industrial products because there's a pandemic. And we saw this during our pandemic as well. We've just gone through a big boom in durable goods manufacturing in the US, right? Because people don't think that cars and refrigerators and washing machines have become unsafe. They want them while they're sheltering from home. Um, flash forward 100 years. In a world of automation and outsourcing, right? Millions of manufacturing jobs have disappeared and they've been replaced by the rise of the great urban service economy, right? 32 million Americans, one fifth of the employed labor force labored in leisure, hospitality and retail trade in 2019. Those were jobs in which the ability to serve a cappuccino with a smile was an employment safe haven in an era of automation and outsourcing. And yet those jobs can vanish and they did vanish in a heartbeat when those smiles turn into a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. And so, you know, by April, of 2020, 45% of America's small businesses were shuttered, at least according to a, a survey that I did with many of my co-authors. And in industries like restaurants or cafes, the damage was even more severe. And if it were not for the fact that the US threw $2 trillion at small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program, right, many of those people would have been uh, permanently unemployed uh, or unemployed for a long period of time. Now, I, I want to make it clear, I am neither endorsing nor you know, attacking the Paycheck Protection Program. I think the jury is still out on this, but I certainly don't think that it was obviously the right call to spend $2 trillion on this at all, um, even though there were economic benefits from it. This just shows you the path of employment. You can see here this light blue line, which starts at the top in 2000. This is manufacturing. It's declined to the bottom by 2010. This yellow and medium blue line, the yellow line is leisure and hospitality. The medium blue line is retail trade. These are the places that provide employment for those people who don't have fancy degrees, um, and they involve face-to-face -face contact. Um, they were the ones that put you on the front line of the pandemic. Professional and business services, this is the orange line up here. In these jobs, people were Zooming their way to survival. And up here are education and health services. In these industries, they, people typically kept their jobs because they had a government backstop, but you know, at least in health, they were often on the front lines of the pandemic in terms of exposure to the disease. Now, I started us off with a question as to how strong was civil society when this disease struck? I think they're much less, I think our cities are much less strong than they were 20 years ago when terrorists destroyed the Twin Towers in New York City. I think we've had 20 years of cities feeling like they're more unequal, more divided. Um, and I wanna highlight four different sources of this weakness. For me, the backstory behind this is related to a book that Manker Olson wrote in 1983 called The Rise and Decline of Nations, where he argued that in a stable society, insiders will basically capture the reins of power and use regulation or other tools to basically, you know, uh, to impose costs on outsiders, to limit competition, to make sure that they get all the rents. When I read this book in the late 1980s, this didn't sound like America at all to me. Over the past 20 years, I think it sounds much more like America. And I think ultimately our cities have to become places for outsiders again, if they're going to thrive. Um, here are different, different versions of these facts. One, cities are bringing productivity, but not opportunity. Opportunity is defined as upward mobility in uh, cities. Meaning how, where does, do the children of the poor end up as adults? And this ultimately comes from data from Raj Chetty and his co-authors on the Opportunity Atlas that measures for, for a cohort born between 78 and 83, where did they end up in the income distribution as adults? Two, successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable, right? So our, our cities are far more expensive than they should be. Three, um, 
we've had a closing of the urban frontier, the fact that our cities are, are locking people out by having too little new housing. And consequently, we end up with great swaths of America where you have large scale permanent joblessness. And four, you have the rise of mass incarceration and uh, unhappiness about policing and race. On the left-hand side shows the relationship between per capita GDP and population density, strong positive relationship. On the, uh, right hand, on, the, on the right hand side is the negative relationship between upward mobility and population density. So what these numbers mean is that in the lowest density areas, a child of a parent who's in the 25th income percentile, so the parent's income puts them below three quarters of uh, Americans during that year, ends up in the 44th percentile if he's in a very low density metropolitan area, and in the 40th percentile in a high density metropolitan area. Um, this shows within metropolitan areas. So this is population density and upward mobility. And here you can see right about this level, it starts falling off a cliff from again, the 44th per percentile down to the 39th. And this is within metropolitan areas. This shows distance to the central business district. It's sort of a monotonic positive thing where the further you move away from the city center, the higher your opportunity is. Um, and finally, this is the regression discontinuity just at the edge of the central city school district, right? So here you have a jump up of about two and a half, three income percentiles if you grew up right outside of the central city school district as opposed to within the central city school district. This shows the decline in your probability of being incarcerated. That means either in jail or prison as, a, as an adult if you grew up right outside the central city school district as opposed to within the central city school district. And this shows the relationship between segregation and upward mobility for African-Americans across metropolitan areas. Um, this shows the rise in housing prices in the densest metropolitan areas in the US over the 1996 to 2012 period. Again, pretty much all of the rising prices in the US occurred in those areas. And this is really a phenomenon which reflects both demand, but also especially supply. So along the horizontal uh, axis here, along the X axis, is the amount of new building measured by the housing permits issued between 2000 and 2013 relative to the housing stock. Along the y-axis is the difference between housing prices and the marginal physical cost of production. So um, in San Francisco, it costs three times as much to buy a house as it does to build a house. In Los Angeles, it's twice as much. And what you can see is the places that build a lot, these are the places over here, aren't expensive. And the places that are expensive don't build a lot. Okay? That is impossible to explain with just housing demand. There's robust demand for housing in San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego and Washington. And there's robust demand in Austin, Texas and Las Vegas. But in one place, the demand shows up in larger quantities of housing because the rules around housing are relatively easy to get through because they haven't overregulated their housing supplies. Or, but in some areas, it shows up just in terms of higher prices because they put their new housing construction in a straitjacket. The fact that you can't move into San Francisco or New York means that we've developed this sort of permanent culture of joblessness in particular parts of America. When I was born in 1967, one in 20 prime age men were jobless. For most of the past 10 years, more than 15% of prime age men have been jobless. But that is very much not a geographically uniform fact. There are particular parts of America, in particular, the, the Eastern heartland, an area that starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through Appalachia and ends up in the cities of the Rust Belt, where more than one in four prime age men are jobless. And make no mistake, right? no matter what you may have heard from the universal basic income crowd, being a low income earner is associated with far less misery than being permanently jobless, at least for prime age men. Right, prime age male men are much more associated with low levels of, of happiness. I'll just show you this. This is, you know, employed earning greater than fifty thousand dollars. This is share reporting low satisfaction. Employed earning thirty five to fifty. Employed earning less than thirty five. So there's a gradient here, but it's modest, and then it just shoots up, right, when you're not working. And you see this relationship also between not working and suicide, between not working and opioid use. And it reminds you that having a job for most people is not just about earning an income, it's about some degree of social connection, it's about some sense of purpose. This just shows the remarkable spatial persistence of not working rates. So this is 1980 to 2010, 30 years, this correlation is over 80% and the coefficient is more than one. Um, and finally, asking yourself, why, does, why do we think that housing plays such a role in this? Well, 30% of the long-term not working men in our, in our country, in the US, are living with their parents. Okay, and so they're getting cheap housing in those areas. And that means, you know, their parents aren't about to give them a bed in San Francisco. So they're stuck in place. 
This shows the incredible rise in the share of Americans who are in prisons or jails. Um, totally American uh, uh, correctional population. And in some sense, this is a story that we tell in our book. Um, Americans, American cities were very much under siege because of high crime rates in the 70s and 80s. We fought this with a very draconian system of very tough policing, often brutal policing, and locking up a huge number of people. The success of those methods is an urban triumph, but it's a very partial urban triumph. It's a very pyrrhic urban triumph because we have caused so much pain to so many people by locking them up for such long, uh, long time periods and by making millions get treated with a fair amount of abuse by cops on the street, which is, you know, and which sometimes becomes cops killing people, which is where these, the, the background for the protests comes from. Now, there is an understandable progressive desire at this moment to actually address these longstanding inequities, to address the inequality of cities, to address the, you know, lack of upward mobility, to address high housing prices. But here's the problem, that in fact, Americans have never become more mobile. And in fact, other people are asking, right, will cities ever come back? Will remote working become permanent? This shows from a, a fairly selected sample. This is a castle back to work barometer. So these are very high end um, office buildings in, in New York and, and other 10 metropolitan areas. And you can see, you know, they're, they're using measure from key cards, key card swap entries. And so they're showing, you know, a 70% decline in the share of people going to these areas, which has not changed, right? This is as of September, 2021, it's still phenomenally low. And it, that's not true for all of America. So for America as a whole, the BLS number is that 50 million Americans were working remotely as of May, 2020, which was at the, at the peak. That's down to 20 million Americans in the latest survey. Um, but in these dense urban uh, businesses, those numbers are, are much greater. It's really stayed down. Now, this is not the first time that people have asked whether or not new forms of communication technology would make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete. Alvin Toffler, a futurist, wrote a very famous book in 1980 called The Third Wave, in which he predicted that the forms of telecommunications that existed then would lead us to seeing, you know, acres of empty skyscrapers. In a sense, he was a product of his age. Cities have always been shaped by the dance between centrifugal and centripetal technologies. The 19th century was a centripetal age, an age in which technologies brought us together. Technologies like the elevator, the skyscraper, the steam engine, the streetcar, the railroad, all of which brought people together in cities because they involved large fixed costs, because they enabled certain types of travel, because they enabled us to build up rather than just building out. And so in the 19th century, urbanization was very centralized and very strong. In the middle decades of the 20th century, there was a great centrifugal age when technologies that ate up distance, most importantly, the automobile, right, which enabled mobility in far-flung farms and, and low-density suburbs, but also radios and televisions, which enabled people to experience the pleasures of a New York City music hall from their home, either in the suburbs or in, in rural Minnesota. right. All of these things enabled a great urban decentralization. On top of this, right, there was a massive you know, technological change in terms of both production techniques and production shipping that meant that it was much cheaper to make goods in lower cost areas or to make goods via machines. And the result was the death of one-time urban industries that were built around older forms of transportation technology. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. That cluster was killed uh, by globalization in the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of jobs writing overnight. And that was the backdrop for Toffler when he was writing in 1980. So he was wondering, why won't these things kill off urban finance? Why won't they kill off urban office buildings? Why won't they kill off urban law firms? Why won't they just mean that everyone goes home and just dials it in? Well, even though he made this prediction, for 40 years, he was wrong. Right? For 40 years, cities came back, in some sense, lifted up by these technologies rather than harmed by them. Um, and I spent much of my career, you know, starting in the early 1990s, explaining why electronic interactions were complements rather than substitutes with face-to-face -face interactions. And uh, so this is uh, the Wallace office at Bloomberg City Hall. You can see here, it's a highly dense area. It's based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg's company, which is based on the Solomon Brothers financial trading floor. Financial trading floors are, you know, in some sense, an anomaly. 
they're an industry in which everyone's really rich, in which they could have desks, and yet they're always right on top of each other. They're, real, they're always right next to each other. And they were one of the first industries in which people said, get back on the floor. Why? Why, were, why are trading floors so dense? Because there is no industry in which it is easier to become a millionaire or a billionaire overnight by being a bit smarter than finance. And so the value of information is so high that it induces people to forego the pleasures of privacy to put up with this knowledge rich, dense environment. You know, if information technology were making face to face contacts obsolete, then why is it that the most famous example of a geographic cluster in the world today is Silicon Valley? Why is it that companies, at least prior to 2020, like Google uh, and um, Facebook, weren't sending everyone home? They were buying vast amounts of urban real estate, right? They were buying you know, vast campuses like the Googleplex and trying to make sure that everyone was next to each other all the time. The reason is quite straightforward. What globalization and new technologies have done is that they've radically increased the returns to being smart. They've radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that become smart by being around other smart people, right? You should have experienced this in your own life. And for teachers, Right? We all know that the more complicated an idea is, the easier it is for that, uh, that idea to get lost in translation. And we have evolved over millions of years to have these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Right? The hardest part about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's knowing whether or not anything is getting through to your students. And right now, I have just absolutely no idea whether or not anything is getting through to you or not, right? because we're not in the same room with one another. Um, so now we've all gone remote. And what have we learned from this? Well, first of all, we have two great studies, the important one, the first one is by uh, Nick Bloom of Stanford, that show us that at least for some jobs, no productivity in the short run is lost by going remote. Nick's randomized controlled trial involving Chinese call center workers shows that you send them home and they do just as well, okay, in terms of their ability to make calls. This is a paper by Natalia, uh, Natalia, Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington, who look at a major American uh, retail company and finds exactly the same thing. People are still making calls at the same rate. But both studies also find something else, which is the promotion rate, the chances of being promoted to a upper level worker, and you can see this is these two lines here, are about double for the on-site workers rather than the remote workers. Now, what does it mean to get promoted to an upper level worker? Well, it means you get given the difficult calls to handle, the real pain in the necks who are you know, wanting something really hard. Okay, now how would you learn how to handle such workers if you were just at home? How would your boss know that you were any good at handling them? You've shut down the information channels, which you know, disables the long-term learning that is so crucial to success in the modern economy by not being at the same place with one another. And so that's one thing which I think is gonna be a permanent limit on our ability to go remote. Similarly, um, there is a great deal of, of difficulty with onboarding, with bringing on new workers remotely. So this shows postings from Burning Glass Technology, which is an aggregator of online postings, and employment from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, Carlos Dabouin and Jose Ramon Morales Aria have divided companies based on the Jonathan Dingle uh, classification into occupations that are remote and occupations that are not remote, meaning they could go remote versus they couldn't go to remote. What you can see here is the non-remotable jobs have a sizable dip in employment when the pandemic strikes, and then they come back, both postings and employment. That's on your left-hand side. On your right-hand side, the remotable jobs have no dip in employment. They keep the old programmers, they keep the old uh, accountants, but look at what's happening to postings. For a year and a half, postings remain collapsed. So even though Microsoft tells us that its pro programmers are just as productive when they're at home, right, hiring for new programmers is down by over 40% between January 2020 and December 2020, right? a massive collapse in new hiring. Um, so even though you can do old jobs, and you can keep old partnerships, right, it's just much harder to form new relationships or to inspire new workers. And I think the overwhelming evidence from the school, the remote school experience, some of which also involves remote uh, randomized controlled trials, shows that online learning is close to a disaster for most ordinary students. The last thing that's important about the online world is that even though a lot of people you and I may know have spent a lot of the last year and a half remote, we need to recognize that that is not a representative experience in the US or Israel or anywhere else, right? Um, at the height of the pandemic, 68.9% of people with advanced degrees, that's this number here, were working remotely. Only 5% of high school dropouts were working remotely. 
Only 15.3% of people who were high school graduates without any college were working remotely. This was a wildly unequal experience, okay, where the less educated people had to go to work or they lost their jobs. Looking forward, if you imagine a world of remote work, you're imagining a world that would be even more unequal than the world of 2019. Now, that does not mean to say that I don't think that there will be major reactions to hybrid work going forward. I think that, there, that you know, talent has never gotten more mobile, which means that cities must be even better. Right? I don't think it's plausible to think that whether or not you're talking about your, your hot Israeli tech company or your hot Silicon Valley tech company, I don't think in either case they're going to say, oh, we're just going to go home to our suburban homes and just dial it in. But they might say, look, we want to move someplace else which has lower taxes, or we want to move someplace else that has better skiing or better surfing or something like that. This is both a potential asset for Israel, which can attract talent, which has become more mobile, but also thing to, thing to watch for, because it's never become easier for talent to actually leave. Um, this is actually a political risk for American cities, because the hunger to deal with the inequities of cities has created a real desire to do something, anything. And yet we've seen this script before. In the 1970s, the progressive dreams of mayors like John Lindsay in New York collided against the reality that suburbanization, highways, containerization made it easier for the firms and the wealthier taxpayers to just get out of the city. This left the city with an inability to pay its dues and it teetered on the edge of bankruptcy, right? Cities need to do things about the, their inequities, but they need to do some, so in a way that does not excessively penalize the wealthy or excessively target the businesses that give it its productivity. In the US, cities rarely have independent taxing power, but they do have the power to do things like defund the police, right? And I think it's important that we look at what happens when the police stop acting, stop, stop doing things. The work of my colleague Roland Fryer and his co-author Tanaya Devi looks at what happens after what are called pattern or practice investigations. These are investigations um, and they look at the ones that follow viral police shootings where a police department ends up on a mic under a microscope where people are looking for you know, racial bias in their actions. What you see in cities like Chicago after these, uh, these things is you see a massive decline in the amount of police activity. And so this just shows the amount of police civilian contacts after the, the pattern of practice investigation begins. This shows it on a daily basis, right? The, this is the investigation, it ratchets down and then it stays permanently lower, okay? Now look what happens on this case, what looks into crime. And this is crime relative to student synthetic control panel. The bottom one is Chicago, the top one is Baltimore. A massive increase in crime follows, right? It is absolutely true that we may want to reform the police in the US. I think it is absolutely right that we wanna be smarter about who we lock up and we want to have a police force that both provides you know, safety and a humane experience for everyone. But that does not cost less, that costs more. And just simply defunding the police is likely to create a, a civil rights catastrophe in the sense that you know, poor children, especially poor children of color, will be targeted and will be killed. Looking forward, I think for cities, everything depends upon the, the, you know, the medical response and the health response. If you know, we get another three years of the Delta variant, if a new pandemic reappears the next five to 10, right? The costs for wealthy world cities and all the economy are enormous, especially for the urban service economy. If we finally get through this in the next year or two, right? And if it doesn't happen again, then this won't change urban life massively. Still, there will be, you know, short-term changes. Commercial space is more vulnerable than residential space. Many people think not going to the office is a, is a really big plus. Very few people think that sitting alone by themselves is a very big, big plus. And so the fact that cities offer human connection continues to be valuable. Urban proximity, both at work and at play, is more valuable for the young than for the old, and the older more afraid of the health consequences, or at least they should be. And so consequently, remote work is more likely to be among the old, and it's this, our cities will become younger, both in terms of their companies and in terms of their people. And of course, global talent has just gotten more mobile, and yet there's an urge to help the urban disadvantage. So, I think it's what's really crucial is that we get smarter government rather than more or less government, right? We need fewer regulations that bind small businesses or builders. And we have a particular need to experiment and evaluate things which will promote upward mobility. In terms of visions of empty offices, what's really important to remember is that you have a price adjustment that can happen. And so in those high-end markets like San Francisco and New York, where prices pre-COVID were very, very high, what you're likely to see, at least once the disease ends, is you're likely to see a 
diminution or decrease in office rents, but not an emptying out of skyscrapers, right? You can have a 20 or 25% reduction in office rents in, in San Francisco and New York, and you'll still be at $60 a square foot, which is more than enough to keep these uh, offices filled. Um, in lower end markets, Grand Rapids, Detroit, Cleveland, there you could very well get vacancies and those vacancies will spiral out because if pe fewer people come into the downtown area for work, you get less demand for urban restaurants or the other services that cater to those businesses. I think looking forward on Israel, the key is to make sure this is an opportunity rather than a, a risk. And so maintaining the focus on startup nation, on ground up entrepreneurship, right? The experience economy is particularly important, not only because it is a source of employment, but it's also what makes cities like Tel Aviv fun. So, you know, making sure you don't have regulations that make it too hard to open a business that provides experiences, be it a, a restaurant experience or anything else. You want to build for flexible uses, right? What we've learned going forward is we don't know whether or not there's going to be more demand for commercial or residential. So the more that you can allow building, which switches, and the more that you can have a permitting environment that makes it easy to switch from one thing to another. It is always appropriate when we think about traffic congestion to think about a, some form of congestion pricing like they've had in Singapore for the last 40 years. And if Israel is going to have autonomous vehicles, autonomous vehicles have just radically reduced the cost of sitting in traffic. And so what we've learned from the behavioral response literature is if you make it cheaper for people to sit in traffic, then more people will be willing to sit in traffic and that will make traffic even worse. You want to make it easier to build, particularly in cities where you have peak demand like Tel Aviv. And so if you're going to have new transportation infrastructure, pay for it by allowing higher buildings, pay for it by having buildings which can actually contribute to this forms of, sand, of forms of the cost of this infrastructure. And finally, invest in global institutions to prevent future pandemic. And that's true for the whole world, right? So I'm not gonna talk very much about this because it's really my co-author, David Cutler, the health economist who's responsible for, for this stuff. But you know, persistent COVID and pandemic means that all rich cities are at risk. We need something that's not the WHO, that is not a, you know, uh, a UN style entity. We need, we didn't need an entity with the kind of muscle that NATO has that's driven on technocratic scientific purposes. And we need to be willing to spend. We favor the idea of a sanitation aid for poor countries in exchange for their adopting rules, which prevent the limitations, that put limits on connections between people and animals and that allow monitoring for future outbreaks. But my last point is that, you know, cities are incredibly resilient. They've been through worse than this. They will survive this. This is St. Paul's in London during World War II and St. Paul's today. And, you know, I at least believe, and this is the, just the copy of our new book, that in fact, cities will come back and they will thrive in the future. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, and everybody just clap. I'm sorry you're in here. Um, oh, wonderful! Thank well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned both congestion pricing and agglomeration. I have a point about the congestion pricing. I need a bit worried that if you uh, price for congestion, you're pricing out people from coming into the city, and then agglomeration will suffer. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, sure. So you'll you'll remember that in, at least in the UK, congestion pricing was the you know was championed by Ken Livingston. <laughs> Ken Livingston's sobriquet was Red Ken Livingston uh, because he was an ardent socialist. And he was in favor of congestion pricing because he thought charge, charging rich people who drive to subsidize poor people who took pa public transportation was a really great thing that he could do for poor people. It subsidizes poor people who take public transportation in two ways, one of which is it provides cash to pay for more buses, but it also means that the streets are, are move more quickly. And so public transportation can move more swiftly. So I agree that, it, it, that the corollary for this is that if you're going to have congestion pricing in, a, you know, in an Israeli context, you need to make sure that you have enough options that are available to poorer people that can enable them to not you know, necessarily need to pay for a car. Now, it's also true that congestion pricing can vary by time of day so, um, and should vary by routes. So that will provide some degree of, of optionality. But really, the goal is for congestion pricing not to be harmful for the poor, but in fact, the opposite of it. Um, and that by using congestion pricing both to fund and to speed up things like buses, you make things better off. I will also just say in terms of public transportation, there's an old line that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to, you know, four words, bus good, train bad. Um, and the reason for this is, is, you know, first of all, just the incredible cost of trains relative to buses. 
Uh, but also the fact that buses are flexible. Buses can be smaller. Buses can, can be autonomous in the 21st century. And so there's just a lot to like about, you know, thinking, experimenting with sort of small, flexible, maybe autonomous, you know, minivans or things like this that can actually take advantage of uh, more empty roads if you do have congestion pricing. I just said I want to ask about uh, the different impact that you have based on uh, the size of different cities, uh, specifically about mega cities such as Shanghai or uh, New York. I don't know if it's considered one, but. Yeah, so the question was, is the question specific to COVID or more general about mega cities versus mid-sized cities? Yeah, yeah, about COVID. About COVID. Okay, so um, there's not, you know, the, the, the COVID literature doesn't, you know, doesn't seem to think that the mega cities are wildly different. It is true, however, that, um, you know, measurement in the developing world of COVID is very imperfect, right? I mean, I talked about Anup Milani's serological work. If you actually just looked at how many cases were reported in Mumbai, you'd get a tiny number. And yet, according to his blood samples, more than 50% of people by July of 2020 had the disease, right? So the measurement is really imperfect in these areas. Um, the, the thing that seems to have made a difference in both India and uh, Brazil is the presence of slums. Now, they have slums in mid-sized cities as well as um, mega cities as well. Um, but um, the, the slums, the informal settlements just seem to be very vulnerable to pandemic because there's no, you know, there's no meaningful barrier between people. Uh, more generally, I, I tend to think about megacities as on a continuum. So uh, as I increase urban size, I tend to increase productivity, but I also increase all of the urban problems, all of the urban challenges, including, you know, congestion, contagious disease, uh, crime, and so forth. And the extent to which those urban problems get worse is then impacted, then determined by the quality of government. So if you take a very functional urban government like Singapore, right? Singapore should be able to deal with almost any level of urban, urban size and make it habitable. If you look at the megacities of the developing world, right? These are places that are both poor and often poorly governed. And consequently, it's very difficult for them to deal with the downsides of density. Now, you get different problems in different parts of the world. So in Latin America, crime is in some sense the central problem, at least pre-COVID, it was the central problem of, of urban scale in, in megacities. Um, in India, it was much more likely to be unclean water. Uh, in China, it was more likely to be um, pollution, bad air quality. So all of these things go on and effectively, effective governments in some sense need to mediate that. And that's, that's the challenge for all of us who are on the side of economic freedom, that in fact, cities actually do need some form of public management, and they, but they need to make sure that if they focus on doing things that actually you know, uh, help people's lives as opposed for the, you know, a tendency to vastly overregulate everything, which can make sure that entrepreneurship is too limited and housing costs are too expensive. Hello, my name is Moore, and I really enjoyed the lecture. And I wanted to ask you, you talked about uh, some health issues in big cities. And I think that the big issue is the pollution and the bad air quality that you mentioned right now. Um, like, I, I believe that uh, big cities right now are developing more and more big um, buildings, and they don't have any space left for and about the pollution. And maybe people, do you think people would still move to cities or less move to cities because of that? So it's a great question. Um, the big fact in U.S. cities is that uh, the air pollution, you know, effect of cities is much smaller than it was in the 1970s. So in 1970, there was a huge air quality gap between big cities and non-urban areas. That has narrowed very substantially. That's true in most of the world. Um, most of the wealthy world. And a lot of that is th there are a couple of things going on there, one of which is it's the flip side of the decline of urban manufacturing. So when cities were about manufacturing, then they had producers that belched smoke into the air. When they became about urban services like finance, that stopped. The second thing that's really important are, you know, government policies like getting rid of catalytic converters in cars. So having unleaded car and like, unleaded gasoline and so forth. Those things have meant that the particulate gap between dense places and less dense places is much, much smaller than it used to be. It doesn't mean that there aren't more things to do, 
Uh, but the air quality in you know, New York or London is just much better relative to, to the rural world relative to what it used to be. Um, that you know, should continue, surely. Uh, air quality is incredibly important, but I don't think of air pollution as being a big challenge facing the cities of, of the wealthy world going forward. It is a problem in the developing world. And you know, the last major trip I made before the COVID pandemic was to Delhi in India. And it took my sinuses five days to recover. That's actually about pollution that occurs in rural areas because of a, a, a burning that goes on on farms as part of a, a less labor intensive way of farming. Um, it's not about necessarily what's happening in the cities themselves, but you also have problems in cities where you have much less paving of roads because particulates get kicked up into the air. Um, so it is really important that cities engage in policies that limit, you know, like getting rid of unleaded gas, like paving over roads, like dealing with you know, effective limits on polluting uh, factories and cities. But I don't think you should see cities as being intrinsically a problem for air quality in the 21st century when they're mostly about urban services. The other thing that's sort of really important about cities is, in fact, if you look at carbon emissions, they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Because, in fact, if you, if you, you know, this is from a paper of mine called The Greenness of Cities with Matthew Kahn from about 10 years ago. If you compare those parts of the U.S. that are more urban to the suburban areas, you see in general less carbon emissions in the more urban areas, holding income and family size constant. And what's going on is that people who live in cities have smaller apartments, have smaller living spaces, which require less energy to heat or cool. And you have much less driving because people are either taking public transportation or they're driving three miles to work instead of 30. And so the compact nature of city life is part of the solution to carbon emissions. A, a fact, this is somewhat old as a fact, but when I wrote this paper, it was true that um, if the great growing economies of India and China see their per capita carbon emissions rise to that seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen in wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30% which is just a way of saying that we all have a lot to gain if the cities of India and China build up rather than building out. So could we perhaps drill down a little bit about this issue of government? I mean, you, you've used the term smart government. I always get nervous when I hear the term smart government. Uh, you talk about the effectiveness of Singapore. Can we, can we refine this picture a little bit more about under these circumstances, how should we think about government? What should government do? be doing what should government not be doing? So that's, that's always a, a great question. And look, you know, the, the book was written by a Democrat and a, and a Republican. And um, we decided as, uh, that we would adopt that, that mantra um, uh, because, you know, traditionally over the last 30 years, I've always been in favor of less government and he's always been in favor, David Cutler has always been in favor of more government. So um, that's, where, that's where we ended up. But there are many things in which, in fact, I believe this is right, that you know, when I look at the US government, I think that just a view that says shut it down is not a very helpful view, especially since what the right has done in the US over the last 40 years, right? And this starts under Reagan, is who you know, was the president of my youth and a hero of my, my youth, right? Which is, we're not really gonna shrink the government that much. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shrink the tax rate. Right. And that just means you're going to allow the deficit to balloon. And I give I give governments far fewer points for reducing taxes than I do for reduce, reducing spending. Um, and certainly that was true during the last four years in which it was all about reducing spending and not actually about reducing. And it was all about reducing taxes and not at all about reducing spending. Um, I think that there are parts of, you know, the function of government going forward where, uh, you know, I very much do not want to see it shrink. So I do not want to see our public commitment to fighting pandemics in the future getting smaller. Um, I think, in fact, we have paid far too little attention to this. We've invested too little in this. Now, I believe that we could do it without spending any more on healthcare. I think that there's plenty of room to cut in terms of America's healthcare spending in which we can keep the size the same. Um, so you know, spending more on protecting pandemics rather than just providing health insurance money for wealthy uh, retirees or you know, for everything. So maybe if you're a little bit smarter about uh, met our Medicare program, you can do more to protect pandemics at the same price. Um, similarly, uh, in terms of providing upward mobility for poor kids. Um, I think what we need to do is have more programs that are experimental, that are effective. You know, we're pushing for this idea of vocational training that wraps around traditional schooling. I don't think you, you should need to necessarily spend any more on education than you're currently spending, but you need to spend more, more effectively. You need to make the spending smarter and targeted towards things that actually deliver more upward mobility than we're currently delivering in cities.
In the case of policing, right, we need to provide policing that is both about keeping city streets safe and about treating people with some degree of respect. Um, that's unlikely to be able to be done, you know, there's no free lunch here like there isn't anything else. And so that's unable, that's unwilling to be done with, with a smaller government. So those are three areas in which I think there is a public commitment to public safety, there's a public commitment to fighting pandemic, and there is a public commitment to upward mobility. Right, or to providing some form of, of education, some form of human capital. These are all central areas in which we've accepted a government role. And uh, they're areas in which I'm frustrated by the low quality of the American, uh, the American public service. And so I think the answer is I'm not willing to just say, let's just give up on these things. Uh, and we've got to manage to make them be smarter.